The Old Testament was mostly written in Hebrew, classical Hebrew, or also known as biblical Hebrew. This ancient form of Hebrew was a part of a larger family of languages known as the Semitic languages. These languages all formed in the ancient Near East, or what we would call today the Middle East, or in Northeastern Africa. Some of the descendants of these languages carry the same names they did then. Hebrew or Arabic or Aramaic are all spoke in modern forms today. But Hebrew was a close cousin and relative of an early ancient civilization known as Canaan. The Canaanite language has a lot of similarities with Hebrew, and some people even think that Hebrew formed out of or came out of Canaanite language which makes a lot of sense since the story in scripture itself claims that Israel came to possess the land of Canaan, Canaan given to them as a promise from God. And so this land would have had a lot of early influences on their language and their culture. Hebrew is a pretty ancient language, but the earliest known archaeological evidence we have from it are from about the 10th century. During the Babylonian exile, Many Jewish people began to speak the chosen language of the Babylonian kingdom, Aramaic. Aramaic became an important part of Jewish cultural identity and life as more and more Jews began to speak it. And eventually, these texts that were written during the exile included some texts written in Aramaic and then handed down in Aramaic from generation to generation. In our Old Testament, certain chapters of the book of Daniel, the book of Ezra, and one verse inside of the book of Jeremiah are written and handed down in Aramaic. These words and these chapters and verses represent about 1% of the overall content of the Hebrew Bible. So 1% was written in Aramaic. Aramaic became such an important part of Jewish culture that even by Jesus' day, most of the Jews would have spoken Aramaic on a day-to-day -day basis in some form or dialect to the region that they existed in. Jesus would have spoken Galilean dialect of Aramaic as he went around and worked in the marketplaces or teached um, in the area of the Sea of Galilee. The Old Testament as we know it today didn't begin to take shape until much later in Israel's history. Many of the texts that we have passed down to us as the Old Testament existed for a very long time, either as written records in Israel's history or as oral traditions passed down from generation to generation. But it wasn't that until probably at the earliest, the second century BC, or maybe even as recent as the second century AD, that the Jewish people began to codify certain texts as being more authoritative or trustworthy about the history of Israel and the revelation of God. Some of the early texts within Israel's history are even lost to us. And some of these texts are mentioned inside of the books that we have in the Old Testament today. Books like Numbers and Joshua, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and Esther and Nehemiah all mention different texts that we have no record of. They, they don't even exist. We don't know how widespread these mysterious texts were used or even what they recounted completely because we have no authoritative version of those texts today. By the time of Jesus, these sacred Jewish texts would have started to become more defined, but they weren't as tightly defined as today. The most authoritative of these texts were the first five in our Old Testament. These books were considered to be the first-hand accounts of Moses as he led the people of Israel out of slavery from Egypt and into the desert and then eventually to the promised land that God had given to them. These texts also included laws which Moses had received from the God of Israel and had given to the people of Israel for them to abide in. These five texts were known in Jesus' day as the Torah, or roughly translated, the law. These books today we often refer to as the Pentateuch, which comes from a Greek term for these books. A couple of hundred years before Jesus lived on this earth, a group of Greek-speaking Jews began to translate many of the Jewish sacred texts into Greek. 
We'll see in a later video how the massive conquering of Alexander the Great was a huge milestone for these texts that are collected into what we now know as the Bible. The Mediterranean world was unified under the empire of Alexander and led to a bigger spreading of both culture and language in a way that the region hadn't seen before. And so Jewish scholars who spoke Greek thought it would be good to translate the, the texts that most people were using into that language for use of Jews all across the Greek-speaking world. They began this process probably as early as 200 BC, but it continued on into the first half of the first century AD, right around the time that Jesus was alive. These texts were important to the early formation of the Old Testament because it included most of the texts that we have in the Old Testament collection today and included 14 or so more texts and additions to some of the texts that we have that we know now call the Apocrypha. In the New Testament Gospels, you'll often read the term law or the law, but it's usually accompanied with another word, and the prophets. And so this term, the law and the prophets, was a generic term used by the people of the day to refer to the base authoritative texts that most Jews had accepted as being meaningful to the revelation of God in the history of Israel. These texts wouldn't have been collected together in one big monolithic book like we have today, mostly out of practicality. Because they would have been recording things on scrolls, they would have kept each book individually. And in fact, some of the books that we have today were even split just because of their length. They needed to be on two scrolls out of pure pragmatic reasons. Books like 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles were really seen by the Jews as being one book and not two. These ancient texts would have been written down on scrolls and handed down generation after generation. These scrolls would have been made of parchment of some sort, and they would have been sewn together to form very long segments, which could have been rolled onto two different spindles. This allowed the readers to unroll to any space within the scroll itself without having to unra unravel the entirety of the scroll. We're going to talk later in a video about the meticulous process that the ancient Jews in the first century AD used to copy these scrolls from one to the other. By Jesus' day, synagogues had become incredibly important to the daily life and worship and teaching of the Jewish people. As the Jewish people spread out all over the Middle East and the entire Mediterranean world, it became very important that they would have localized centers as places for teaching and worship where rabbis could minister to Jews in that area. Each of these synagogues would have purchased and kept copies of these ancient scrolls. They kept them in a special room right off of the main chamber of worship. We don't know exactly which texts were widely used or how authoritative they were taken as. The Septuagint is a good indication of at least which texts were popular enough to translate into Greek, but even the Septuagint was no authoritative collection of the Jewish sacred texts. We didn't really get the form of our Old Testament until much later in the Middle Ages. The, a group of Jewish scholars known as the Masoretes attempted to solidify how the oral tradition was passed down from generation to generation. In the Hebrew language, there was no actual letters for vowel sounds, only consonants. And so the way you learn how to pronounce words which had vowel sounds was through oral tradition, was learning how to speak the language and read the language. As the Hebrew language was spoken less and less consistent, consistently, the, that oral tradition began to break apart and the Masoretes really wanted to preserve it. And so they formed a system of vowel markings in and around the original Hebrew alphabet in order to preserve what they were learning through history, the oral tradition of each of these words and how they sounded. By the time the Masoretic texts were completed and compiled at the end of the first millennia AD, they were usually split into three different sections and referred to as the Tanakh. 
The Tanakh was an acronym of the three names of the three sections. The first section was known as the Torah, which we've already talked about, uh, which roughly translate as law or teaching. These were the first five books of the Bible. The second section was known as the Nevi'im, or translated as prophets. And the, prophet, the prophetic books included 19 different texts. These texts were actually split even further into three subcategories. The former prophets that included people like Samuel and Joshua. And then in the latter prophets, which included people like Isaiah. And then the minor prophets, which are a lot of the smaller prophetic books we find in the Old Testament. In the final section, it's called the Ketuvim, or roughly translated as writings. These were the other books that didn't fit into the previous two categories, but were considered sacred and authoritative by the Jews in the end of the first millennia AD. These texts included poetic books like the Psalms, or books that were read and associated with specific festivals like Esther, which was read during Purim. And then it also included history books that were written by people not considered to be prophets, like First and Second Chronicles. If you're keeping track at home, these different amounts of texts, the five in the Torah, the 19 in the Nevi'im, and the 12 in the Ketuvim, adds up to just 36. And we know that in our Old Testament, we have 39. So what about the three missing texts? Well, this is just easily explained by the fact that the Jewish people lumped books that we cut into two books together as one. For example, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. They concluded them as one volume in their text where we split them into two. And so this is the basic formation that we have today as our Old Testament. Because when the reformers were beginning to look at the Catholic texts and determine what their Protestant Bibles would look like, they looked to what the Jews considered authoritative for their scriptures in order to inform what the Christians should consider authoritative for their scriptures. And so many early reformers would separate out the books of the Apocrypha into its own section or just drop them all together. The formation of the Old Testament is a very complicated matter. This video is a very cursory overview meant to give you just the basic strokes so that you can take some of the information here and do research on your own as you're curious about it. Entire books have been written about the way that the Old Testament came to be. Suffice it to say for this video that the Old Testament is a very ancient book written over millennia worth of time, a process of divine and human activity, and it didn't come about in a prepackaged book overnight super cleanly, something we should take into consideration as we study this text for ourselves.